Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Amsterdam. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a particularly nice background for you today, but I'm noticing <laughs> in the mirror, not only do you get to see the fact that I'm packing my luggage and getting ready to come back to the States, but you get a little view reflected out the window onto the beautiful Amsterdam street scene. I am sorry that I'm unable to come to you live today, but my plane, uh, it turns out, is exactly uh, departing when I would be starting today's talk with you guys. So uh, the show must go on, and, and uh, Amy and Genevieve generously agreed to let me do this uh, uh, recorded for you, and, and so I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I think today will be the last of this series that we've been doing on uh, building a better economy. Um, and so let me just get things set up real quickly for you. And, and I think they're good to go now. Uh, I'm going to try to um, indicate to you a variety of ideas that are concrete reform ideas, but also ideas about repairing democracy itself, the institutions that would be necessary in order to re-regulate the economy. And, and, and part of the suggestion here is that we've lost the capacity, the power, the civic solidarity, the trust in government to do this well. So we can't just build new governmental capacity we need, I'm sorry, we, we, yeah, we, 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 we have to build new governmental capacity in addition to re-democratizing uh, the economy. That's, that's, that's the big takeaway from this lecture series. Um, we, we've talked together, and, and I'm just going to refresh memory very quickly, about the way in which over the last 40 years, the state and the law have really been taken over by private interest and, and how this has allowed for the accumulation of vast fortunes and new gilded age and new levels of inequality that are just staggering. And, 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 and the mistrust and discontent, the grievance that has resulted as so many people's expectations of kind of secure middle-class prospects have been shattered as economic mobility has essentially uh, been uh, removed for half of the, the population. We, we've also talked about just last week together what this does to a democracy and and uh just to summarize ever so briefly right two diagrams that i think really bring this home um that perhaps the united states is really better described as an oligarchy than as a democracy that on the one hand there really is no political responsiveness on the part of our elected officials to average persons but there is real responsiveness to both the top 10 percent and to interest groups and then you add to that uh, the level of campaign funding by the top 0.01 percent right 40 percent of the money spent in american politics uh in recent years and 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 it becomes absolutely clear right that the reason our politics is not responsive to average persons is because it's essentially not funded by them. That has all of the hallmarks of an oligarchy. Power has been purchased by the hyper wealthy. Um, I've shown you this diagram multiple times before. Today, I want to emphasize one thing, right? We're, we're in an economy where basically half the population lives on a uh, income that puts them very close to the poverty level, that makes them very precarious, that this has coincided with tremendous generation of wealth, but it is skewed in its distribution so that a large portion of income and wealth are going to the very, very, very wealthy, the top 0.01%, the top 1%, the top 10%, you know, the, that's the broadest group. And even that group is basically just seeing its income increase at the rate of the overall economy. This is resulting in 
many people uh, not just being economically insecure, but really having their entire sense of social belonging threatened. Um, and one measure of that, one reflection or echo of that is the rise in deaths of despair and this epidemic of deaths of despair that we've had in this country for the last 20 years. I want to return you to what I think of as a really powerful sociological generalization in thinking about this data for the last time in this series. And, and that is this equation at the bottom of the uh, header for the diagram here. Scarcity generates competition, generates scarcity. And, and the, the idea here, right, is if you live in a social world in which the goods that you require are not available in a sufficient supply, many people will naturally try to do what they can to hoard or to secure for themselves those goods, right? And, and, and those resources, which are essential to survival or to social standing or security, um, if we compete for them, right, we are much less likely to cooperate in securing a sufficient share of them for everyone. And so competition as opposed to cooperation tends to further scarcity, right? So scarcity generates competition, competition generates scarcity, and then we're in one of those feedback loops, those self-reinforcing cycles in which uh, something bad causes something else bad, reinforces the original cause, and we tend to spiral into greater and greater inequality. And, and, and this is the situation that seems to me to have transpired in the United States and in its economy over the last 40 years, this is what we're seeking to address. And, and I just wanted to add scarcity generates competition, which reinforces scarcity to get a sense of the way in which you can lock, get, get locked in to this dynamic and, and then how difficult it can be to escape. This was the, 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 the new idea I introduced last week. And um, the, the core idea here is that in the 21st century, probably really for much of democratic history, but certainly after the industrial, the first industrial revolution in the middle of the 19th century, that has no longer been the case that we can assume that democracy will simply be met halfway, greeted by friendly and hospitable social circumstances in the economy especially, but also in the organization of the public sphere, in perhaps the organization of civil society as well. And so whereas the ideas that gave rise to the American Revolution and many of the early democratic revolutions and constitutions assumed what we have to do is organize the state democratically and then people will want to take advantage of the opportunities that a democratically organized state affords and on the other hand that um, society is not going to be per se hostile to democracy. Already in the last third of the 19th century, many progressive and populist activists had begun to mistrust that faith in the idea of society basically being benign, so that all that was important was getting the political rights and institutions as democratic as possible. If you look at, and, and here I'm, I'm going to highlight um, John Dewey and Louis Brandeis, but, but a, a whole string of progressive reformers in the late 19th, early 20th century, what they're saying is, is this is no longer the case. And so democracy has to take on an additional task, and, and that is actually legislating to regulate the economy and to regulate other aspects of the social environment, for instance, to create public schools so that you have an educated citizenry, or to offer support for 
unions or for public spaces like the parks that we see in so many states and cities, right? Central Park in New York City, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco were part of a movement to create public space for average citizens in an appreciation of the democratic potential of allowing people to freely congregate in space that was no longer being created spontaneously by society, right? And, and, and so I've suggested two different models for democratic efforts to secure a socially hospitable environment. One of them, democratic self-protection. And, and this is recognizing that society is likely to change or contain forces that are hostile, hostile to democracy. And so the intact, strong democracy needs to not only preserve its central institutional structure, but also be wary of what's happening in the broader social environment. And one way to read what's happened in the last 40, 50 years in many democracies is we have neglected the project of democratic self-protection. And that puts us then in the realm of democratic self-repair, where not only does democracy in order to preserve itself, in order to protect itself, need to work not only to make sure that its central institutions are functioning, that for instance, its representatives are actually responsive to the desires, interests, preferences of the majority of its members, but also that the economy is not accumulating so much wealth and power in so few hands that it's bound to subvert democracy, right? That's the, the focus for these lectures, but that just illustrates one way in which democracy may be eroded by a hostile social environment. Once it's neglected the task of securing a more hospitable social environment, it tends itself to be democracy tends to be damaged, right? And, and, and I've shown you a bunch of evidence. I'll review it very briefly that our democracy is damaged and that it's damaged because we have neglected democratic self-protection -protect for at least 40 years. And so we're really much more in the democratic self-repair box on this diagram than in the self-protection. And, and that's a still more difficult project because you have to simultaneously try to rebuild democratic capacities and responsiveness while also trying to address the hostility of the social world to the uh, democratic institutions you're trying to repair, right? And, 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 and so you have to do two at once and you have to do them from a place in which democracy is already damaged, is already weakened. And, and, and so that is the, the moment we're in, and that is the particular difficulty we face. Last week, I, I, I shared with you my list of 19 ways in which democracy is damaged. Today, I will just introduce you to the reintroduce you, I should say, to the to the eight categories of uh democratic damage that, that I've constructed. And, and I don't claim any originality for this. This is really just pulling together a bunch of stuff we've talked about before and that is very much out there in the literature. Source number one, the, 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 there are multiple sources of reactionary authoritarian impulses in the world today, including in democratic societies. And as we are seeing, uh, this is destabilizing democracy in many places, the world leading to democratic backsliding in the democratic world. These authoritarian impulses are being articulated in partisan politics by political parties that are increasingly moving in the direction of illiberal populism, at, at attacking the rights that protect minorities, attacking members of the minorities themselves, attacking democratic institutions when the democratic institutions 
don't favor the liberal populace. Um, the third I, category, big category here, erosion of democratic norms. This tends to happen when a party turns against democracy or hedges, makes its support for democracy contingent upon winning power, right? Um, obviously, we saw this in the United States in the aftermath of the 2020 election. Uh, a decay of the infrastructure of democracy. And here I'm not paying as much attention to elections and parties so much as civil society, uh, broad-based organizations that allow people to come together, political participation on the part of average people as opposed to elites capturing institutions. And, and again, I think we're seeing across the board in the democratic world a um, decline in the health of the infrastructure of democracy. A deformed public sphere, this hardly needs mentioning, but <laughs> mistruth circulates widely, easily, readily, and far too often is very difficult to differentiate from what is true or credible or verified. Um, Algorithmically amplified affect, right? We, we live in a world where so many of us spend so much time on our devices. And as we do, we are on social media and the social media are engineered, right? You know, millions upon millions of dollars have been spent to get our attention captured by them. One of the best ways to do that is to play on rage or anxiety or grievance on these raw emotions that then having been uh, amplified, they don't just recede when we come off the device, right? And frequently what we're looking at on the device is stuff about the real world, trying to tell us that there's some conspiracy to rob our power to overturn the results of the election, et cetera. And, and so this makes us far more receptive to the illiberal populism or simply to the partisan polarization and mistrust that animates our politics. Um, state that is structured, uh, I'm sorry, state structure that is distorted by drift, right? And, and, and so here the suggestion is, right, especially in the United States, still working with an 18th century constitution, but in many societies that don't have sufficiently responsive mechanisms to update their constitutions as social circumstances change, we end up trying to work in the procrustean bed of our old constitution as new social problems arise. And as I'll talk about a fair bit today in the United States, that's meant the rapid growth of an administrative state, and, and I'll say more about this in a few minutes, but a whole um, vast array of administrative agencies created by Congress, but associated with the executive that really don't have a clear or comfortable place, constitutionally speaking, and do not have a democratically articulated structure, and so mechanisms of accountability. Finally, and obviously globalization has meant that so much of the power, so much of what influences us escapes the boundaries of the nation state, yet democracy tends to be organized at the level of the nation state. So all of that has then pushed political parties um, in the direction of illiberal populism, uh, ethno-national authoritarianism, mistrust, disinformation, and obviously we are seeing that, have seen that in this country, especially in the aftermath of the 2020 election, all of this partisan animosity making it really hard for us to come together, all of this uh, attraction to authoritarian leaders willingness to mistrust and even try to overturn elections. So um, I, I want to concentrate today on policy. And again, I, I, I've, I've assembled an, a list here 
and I'm not going to go through everything on the bus. What I want to do is try to exemplify the basic approach that I, I, I want to take. And, and the approach actually, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna go forward a little bit because I'm not seeing here, here it is. I, I, I'm not sure, I, I, I guess I thought I would wanna talk about this later, but I wanna talk about it right now. Um, the what I'm calling the guideposts for a democratic political economy. And, and the reason I want to start here is I want to talk about values before talking about policies. And I suspect that that most of the policies that I'm going to discuss with you might, in fact, if implemented and allowed to take hold to actually work over say a decade become incredibly popular policies the way that social security medicare medicaid today have become the third rail of american politics you can't touch them right